Daydream Believers is something I imagine most people won't have heard of. I certainly hadn't until recently, despite considering myself to be pretty familiar with most of Mitchell and Webb's material, but after watching it, as well as listening to it, which is something I'll expand upon later, I think Daydream Believers is a pretty interesting little project, and one that's definitely worth discussing. Though, I'll admit, direct comparisons to other Mitchell and Webb material would be kind of disingenuous. This show is not really anything like Peep Show, nor is it immediately comparable to any one show in particular that I've seen. I've noticed myself tending to throw the word weird around pretty freely when discussing things on my channel, but trust me here. When I say Daydream Believers is pretty weird, I mean it is pretty damn weird. <laughs> For a long time now, British TV network Channel 4 have been giving upcoming new voices in the British comedic scene a chance to showcase their abilities to the general public. Comedy Showcase, Comedy Lab, 4 Funnies, they're all TV shows and schemes that have aired unrelated comedy pilots from a wide range of writers, comedians and comedic actors, with the eventual end goal being for those individual episodes to catch enough people's attention and interest that those pilots and concepts get expanded upon further into a full series. Other networks have programs that do this thing too, for example the BBC currently have their comedy feed series and had things like the comedy playhouse in the past and you know these kinds of shows have actually been incredibly successful both for the networks and for those involved in the individual pilots for example a few years before they became big stars ricky gervais and stephen merchant wrote golden years for channel 4's comedy lab which could be seen as one of the building blocks that eventually led to the creation of the office when did you get your ear pierced oh that up the yonks it's bleeding really stings how long have you had that too long, baby. It's bleeding. Really stings. And I've already made a video about the pilot episode for the now very successful People Just Do Nothing, which was originally made for BBC Three's Comedy Feed series. Can you see that? Even some big names you may not associate with this kind of comedy, or even comedy at all, got their first major exposure in television shows that were made off the back of successful pilot episodes that were broadcast as part of opportunities like this. Will Poulter, for example, now known for films like Midsummer and The Revenant, had one of his first big roles on screen in The School of Comedy, a sketch show from 2009 that was greenlit after it had a pilot on Channel 4's Comedy Lab. Wait. Right, okay, then follow me. Two people that also had a pilot on Comedy Lab were David Mitchell and Robert Webb, who at this point in 2001 were in their mid-twenties and had started to establish themselves in the world of TV comedy after a number of years working together on stage. By this point, they had also written and starred in multiple television programs, including their own sketch show, The Mitchell and Webb Situation, which ran for six episodes, and the also six-episode long ensemble sketch show Bruiser, physical copies of which are now apparently really fucking expensive. Wow, I'm glad I bought mine a long time ago. And what better way to continue the upward trend in your career than by penning a sitcom pilot with your best friend, getting it on TV and becoming the next big thing in British comedy. It sounds great. Unfortunately for David and Rob, Daydream Believers, the pilot they wrote and starred in from 2001, did not lead to a full series, and to this day it remains almost universally unknown. My channel, which has so far been mainly focused on obscure TV pilots, the works of Mitchell and Webb, and comedies from the 2000s would seem like one of the only places that discussion of something like this would pop up, as it ticks literally every single one of those boxes. Yet in all of the thousands of comments that have been left, I have not seen a single one that references Daydream Believers. Though of course it wasn't all bad for David and Rob, as a few years later they star in a little old comedy known as Peep Show, which has done pretty well for itself. So just think, if the Daydream Believers pilot had been a success and it had led to a full series, we may have never had the Mark Corrigan and Jeremy Usborne that we all know and love today. So maybe it was a good thing that things turned out as they did for the project. <laughs> well, good, that's good. Funnily enough, in 2007, around the time of Peep Show's fourth series, Sam Bain and Jesse Armstrong, the two main writers of Peep Show, would themselves go on to write a pilot together for Channel 4's Comedy Showcase, being titled Ladies and Gentlemen, which also did not go any further than that one episode. So Daydream Believers is kind of an oddity in the Mitchell and Webb back catalogue. Their shows prior to this still get watched and referenced by the masses, their shows after this do too, yet slap bang in the middle we have an unsuccessful attempt at a sitcom, which is pretty interesting, especially because it doesn't just star Mitchell and Webb as actors, but it was also written by them too. Oh, and I also should clarify something. Daydream Believers is not some piece of lost media that I've unearthed or anything. You can find it freely available to stream on Channel 4's 4OD service right now. If you really want to experience some obscure Mitchell and Webb comedy for yourself before you hear a monotone man ramble on about it incessantly, I'd recommend doing that now. But is Daydream Believers a hidden treasure or is it best left behind in the past? Let's talk about it. I expect yours is much less fucked up. Sorry, do you mind that word? Especially. Thank fuck. 
The pilot focuses on our two main characters who both live together in Billericay, Essex. Ray, played by David Mitchell, and Colin, played by Robert Webb. Ray is a successful sci-fi writer and is thus pretty well off. He owns a big house in a nice area and seems to be living pretty well, though he's very much single. Colin, his friend, seems to be a bit of a freeloader who doesn't have much going on in his life, and he lives in Ray's house too. Ray has just bought a new BMW, and while him and Colin are admiring it, they notice that somebody is moving into number 69, the house next door to theirs. Hi there. Hello. That person is Jill, and she comes over to introduce herself, which Ray makes pretty awkward. That's nice. Hello. Hello. Yes, hello. After meeting a group in a park, Colin has recently become a member of an anti-capitalist cell named Final Solution, which seems to be comprised of some pretty hair-brained individuals. If there's one thing that's been really getting on my nerves lately, it's capitalism. The group plan to protest capitalism, but Colin couldn't get the things they wanted to use in their protest, so he improvises by acquiring some slightly less impressive equipment. The episode ends with the group stamping on fast food, pulling party poppers and spraying silly string, which obviously doesn't amount to much of a protest. They seem to be having a lot of fun though. That might sound pretty underwhelming as a premise for a pilot, and certainly doesn't sound too weird, as I said the thing was earlier. Ooh, comfy. But now let me introduce you to the gimmick that Daydream Believers uses, the thing that makes this show unique. Ray is a sci-fi writer, and throughout this episode he is continually writing a new novel. I'm actually a writer of science fiction for my sins, as it were, if you like, I'm just talking now. Everything that happens in the real world of Daydream Believers has either a direct or indirect parallel to something he then writes about in his novel, and we see this story he's writing via cutaways that show it being acted out. It's kind of difficult to explain. Well, that's not too bad. So for example, when Ray gets to know the people from Colin's anti-capitalist group, we see the sci-fi story that he's writing, and the same actors that portray the anti-capitalists are now shown as these monk druid hippie people, whose relation with the sci-fi universe parallels of Ray and Colin kind of mimic the way that Ray sees them in real life. You must learn to live in peace. Too right! I've just got one or two things I want to get out of my system first. Or a more straightforward link like this is that in the real world, Ray gets a brand new BMW, a Beamer, as some may call it. Then his sci-fi story has his character getting a brand new Beamer, as in a teleportation device. Yes, Info. They've just delivered my brand new Beamer. The full title of this pilot is indeed Daydream Believers, Brand New Beamer. So you're basically seeing the real story play out in the real world, while simultaneously seeing Ray writing a sci-fi story that uses his exaggerated takes on the events that are happening in his life as inspiration. And these two things are interspliced repeatedly throughout the show's duration. Then while the real story is acted out like somewhat of a conventional sitcom, the sci-fi stuff is played more loosely and self-aware, and it's kind of intentionally hammy and clumsy, with Ray making changes to it on the fly. It's just boring. I bet even your characters are bored. Can you all not look so bored? It's a very, very unorthodox approach to a sitcom, and one that I'd say you need to fully watch to comprehend. It's like Peep Show meets Star Trek meets Spaced meets Red Dwarf meets Sketch Comedy. It feels like the kind of thing you'd see in a comedy show at a theatre or something, with the obvious difficulty in needing to change from one universe to the other every few minutes being part of the act. But this is a pilot episode of a sitcom. Jesus. It's bizarre from a conceptual standpoint, and is one that, not to get too ahead of myself, I do kind of like, but I can fully understand why something like this would not appeal to a lot of people. But at the end of the day, a concept is just a concept. You can have the most odd premise imaginable, but if you execute it well, having a unique idea like this would surely only be seen as a positive thing. So having acknowledged this premise, and hopefully explained it to the point where you kind of get what I mean, let's get into a deeper look at what Daydream Believers is actually like. Oh yes, this sounds tremendously exciting. I'll start with Ray, David Mitchell's character. He's meant to come across as a bit of a weird guy and I definitely think that was achieved. Physically he looks pretty normal. Well, he dons a couple of t-shirts that are a bit out there, but they don't do anything more with his appearance than that. However, when David's playing Ray, he speaks in that voice he often does. I'll play a few clips of it now and I guarantee if you've ever seen or listened to any of the various Mitchell and Webb sketch shows before, you'll have heard him speaking in this voice a couple of times in them. It seems to be one of his go-to weird guy voices. Oh, come in. We were having quite a nice adult conversation actually, Colin. Oh, I see. I guess it's because I've seen David acting in so many things by this point, but I can't hear Ray as anything other than David Mitchell doing that voice when I watched Adrian Believers, though that obviously wouldn't have been the case for a viewer in 2001. Ray is a strange, awkward guy and doesn't seem to have much social interaction outside of Colin, leading to him being either embarrassing or overly annoyed and hostile in his interactions with his new neighbour and the anti-capitalist group respectively. 
I guess what they're going for is that he has socially isolated himself in this big fancy house and so doesn't really get out much, rather choosing to spend his time writing his sci-fi stories. Stories which, if the one he's writing in this episode is anything to go by, don't seem to be very good. Were David and Rob possibly making a statement about sci-fi authors making a lot of money off of writing low quality material with the Ray character? Possibly. There is a comment that Ray makes when talking about his new Beamer that could be implying that his books are kind of a rush job. Baron Amstrad's Rictus of Evil must have sold pretty well then. Yeah. Looks like that late night was worth it. I imagine that may have been a theme that they could have expanded upon further if this pilot was developed into an actual series. There's quite a few elements in this episode that feel like that too. Ideas that don't really have the time to be fleshed out fully, but feel like they may have had some legs to them. For example, the episode starts with Ray getting Colin to apply some cream to a rash he apparently has on his back, and this gets referenced a few more times throughout the episode. Is this about your back rash? Uh, it's actually one of the funnier jokes here in my opinion, and leads to a great interaction between Ray and Colin a bit later on. But it feels a bit random and out of place without any context, and it doesn't have much to do with the general overarching story of the episode. The real life story that is, as Ray's parallel in his sci-fi story, the glorious Baron Amstrad, is wheelchair bound and is covered in bright green spots after being afflicted with the space plague because a prostitute sneezed on him, which is Ray's slightly more extreme interpretation of his back rash I suppose. Damn this space plague. Baron Amstrad looks fantastically goofy and sci-fi-y, and he acts in that same way too. This project was made during the midst of the Star Wars prequel releases, and Amstrad's hair certainly looks to have taken some inspiration from Natalie Portman's character in the first one. It's funny in both a haha look at the show's crude attempt at imitating a popular style kind of way, but also Ray copying something from a sci-fi character that was big at the time is funny, and fits in well with his character supposedly being a lazy or derivative writer. I guess the character's name being Amstrad fits with that idea too. Ray just took the name from the electronics company, not even bothering to change it up slightly despite it literally being the name of the main character of his series of books. He could have flipped that name and made something like Baron Damstra or Baron Stamrad, but he didn't even bother to put in that minuscule amount of effort, and that's pretty funny to me. I think they do a pretty good job with characterising both Ray and Baron Amstrad, and the way that it's done is fairly fun and interesting. You have the socially awkward weirdo with Ray, and then his self-insert character as a powerful leader who controls the spaceship and has a crew that works under him, showing what he wants to be like in real life. You're right. I can do what I like. It works, and I definitely do like Ray. I think he's a fun protagonist, and is probably my favourite character in this pilot. Though I will reiterate something I said about him earlier, that it's very hard to not just see this character as David Mitchell doing that voice he does. When I watch something like Peep Show, obviously I know that I'm watching David Mitchell acting, but I totally buy him as Mark Corrigan. I see Mark like a real person, removed from the fact that he's obviously David Mitchell playing a character. While watching Daydream Believers, I never really buy into any of these characters as real people in that same way. Partly down to simply only getting one episode with them perhaps, but I think more so because of the way that the show is written, particularly the dialogue and the execution of jokes, but I'll get to that stuff a bit later. I think this is going to be quite a long video. Wow. As long as it takes. Robert Webb plays Colin, who is Ray's friend, lodger, and after meeting the group in a park, a new anti-capitalist. He is also the android Info in Ray's novel, the name obviously being a not-so-subtle parody of Star Trek's Data, which again fits with the idea that Ray is not exactly original with the characters in his novels. Colin is, like Ray, a bit of a weird guy, though I'd say he's probably less of an oddball than Ray, as he does have some lines that hint at him wanting to invite friends over to the house, and he just handles himself slightly less strangely overall. He often comes across as quite cynical, especially in relation to Ray's work, and also to society, which is intentionally broad and vague throughout the episode to show that he doesn't really know what he's talking about. They just don't take any shit from the system. Who needs all this shit, they say, and I'm inclined to agree. What shit? You know, the system. The show sets up Ray and Colin to be a lead pair, and they both get a pretty similar amount of screen time, but it's hard not to see Ray as the much more important character here. Ray has the sci-fi writing, which is what the gimmick of the show revolves around, and he feels like much more of a fleshed out character than Colin does, given that we know his occupation, and we hear a decent amount about him as a person. We don't actually find out much about Colin in this episode, other than that he lives with Ray and has recently become an anti-capitalist, as I said. Robert Webb isn't doing one of his weird guy voices for Colin like David is with Ray, and he sounds, well, just like how Robert Webb actually sounds. I couldn't go back really after what they did to your lovely Beamer. And he doesn't have anything visually notable about him either. He dresses like how I imagine Robert Webb may have dressed in 2001. Though I will say that in one scene in which Colin gate crushes Ray's attempt to flirt, or whatever it is that he's trying to do when he's talking to Jill, Aren't you nice, Jill? It's clear how much Robert has improved as an actor since this episode was made. I'll play you a little bit of it. Hi. Hello, Jill. 
Our new flavor of the month all of a sudden. I expect you're gonna thank me for getting you out of that one. Now I'll tell you that in that clip, Colin is supposed to be really drunk after having just been to the pub. I didn't even notice that this was supposed to be the case when I initially watched this episode until Ray points it out. Please ignore Colin, Jill. I think he's been to the pub. Colin's speech is all over the place, changing from normal to overly slurred, seemingly at random. Sometimes he's moving like a drunk person, sometimes he's moving completely normally, all in the same scene. This doesn't bother me or anything, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. But I think it's worth pointing out, as Robert has ended up actually having to do drunk acting a fair few times in his career, and I think he's actually pretty good at it now. I've got coupons for the Pringles. Being able to see an actor's earlier, less polished work is a great way of gaining a further appreciation of their performances from later on in their careers. I like Colin. Similar to Ray, I think he's a fun character and he has some really great lines, but I don't think he works quite as well as Ray did. In my opinion, it's because he's quite inconsistent in the way he's portrayed. Sometimes he's almost cartoonishly buddy-buddy and friendly. Put it here, mate. You've really done it but then he's also often quite hostile and antagonistic without much setting him off. His personality seems like it changes on a whim to fit the scene that he's in, which makes it seem like they weren't really sure what to do with his character. He's a lot harder to read than Ray is, which, you know, may have been intentional. Mitchell and Webb may have made Colin a bit scatterbrained on purpose to make the storyline of this episode fit a bit more. The whole randomly becoming part of an anti-capitalist group named after a Nazi genocide plan certainly would seem to suggest that's the case. Welcome everyone to the 15th meeting of Final Solution, the Bill of Ricky Sell of the anti-capitalist movement. Fuck the state. But I think it's very important to give your audience a clear look at who your characters are in a pilot. It should be written in a way that lets us see what our leads are like as people, and we should understand their relationship with each other. And I don't think you fully get that with Colin here, at least not in comparison to Ray. He's not bad, I don't dislike him, I don't want to be misconstrued here, but I think a better job could have been done with introducing Colin, the way he acts, and his relationship with Ray. To me, it does feel like there was less of a plan with his character. I'll reiterate a point that I said earlier, in that it does somewhat feel like Colin is playing second fiddle to Ray, despite it feeling like the show is wanting to present them as equal leads. Anyway, we're not discussing theory today. Though one area in which David and Rob's character not being equal makes perfect sense, and it's actually a good thing, is in the sci-fi side of the episode. David is Baron Amstrad, the leader of the spaceship, whereas Robert is Info, Baron Amstrad's subservient android companion. Of course Ray is going to write himself as a superior to everybody else, and is going to have Colin be his underling, because that's how he sees their relationship in real life. I think Info is great, and he has some of my favourite lines from the episode. He has this quirk where he says, beep out loud mid-sentence with no change in inflection, which is really stupid and charming. Our policy, sir, beep. You're quite right, sir, beep. He's an intentionally corny character, and I think he plays off of Baron Amstrad in a really fun way. Info changes from robotically speaking like an android to talking normally and shouting just like a regular person on a whim, and this inconsistency is really fun. I imagine it's supposed to be another example of Ray's writing not being very good. Also, he has this fantastically gaudy space android costume that makes him look like the Tin Man crossed with a raver, which really adds to his goofy character. See, that is typical. Beep. So overall, the two characters played by David Mitchell and the two characters played by Robert Webb are all really fun. They all deliver some great lines, and the pair clearly have great chemistry together, something which I probably don't need to reiterate. They've been comedy partners for years by this point, and so that's not really a surprise. So writing and starring in a sitcom is obviously a completely different beast to writing and performing comedy sketches and plays, so I'm glad that their noticeable bond translated well into this new format for them. But there are of course other characters in Daydream Believers, not just the ones played by the two front men, and I think they're a rather mixed bag as far as the supporting cast go. Oh, marvellous. Let's have a go. Let's start with Olivia Coleman, a longtime friend and partner of Mitchell and Webb's who has appeared with them in numerous projects before this and who has great chemistry with the pair, plays a character who barely does or says anything at all. She doesn't play a character that has a parallel in the real world, but just one that solely exists in Ray's sci-fi story, a woman named Linda that has some sort of job on the spaceship, one that involves her constantly interacting with this rather impressive prop. By my rough count, she's in about five minutes worth of scenes, give or take, and even in those, her role isn't one of the most important ones. I actually found this really surprising, as after finding out Olivia was in Daydream Believers, I was sure she played one of the bigger roles, but no, she doesn't. And we've sustained no losses apart from the fact they did sneak in and vandalise your beam. Don't get me wrong, it's not like she's an extra or anything. She does have lines and is someone that's necessary in the episode, but she's maybe the sixth most important character in the sci-fi side of the episode, behind Amstrad, Info, and the three hippie druid people. And as I said, she doesn't appear at all in the real life side of the story. I'd possibly 
possibly say that this feels like wasted potential in not having her play a bigger role, but I think that may just be an opinion served up with a big helping of hindsight. The Olivia Coleman of 2001 and the Olivia Coleman of the present day are in completely different stratospheres of popularity and acting prowess. Her character, Linda, is not overly funny. That's entirely down to the way she's written though. It's not like Olivia is unfunny, but rather her character is not really given many jokes or comedic lines. She still does have a couple of good moments though. In fact, given that her name is just Linda, not something very spacey or sci-fi-y, and she acts almost like a secretary or something of the sort, it may just be the case that her character was supposed to be a less comedic and more down-to-earth character to contrast with the rest of the cast anyway. Space pun partly intended. I'm honestly surprised that Olivia didn't play the role of Jill, the woman who moves in next door to Ray in the episode. Well, that's interesting. Yes, sorry. <clears throat> that's interesting. Jill is the lead supporting actress in the real world and doesn't appear in the sci-fi story, while Linda is the only female sci-fi character that doesn't appear in the real world, there's a weird disconnect here. I wonder if at one point these two roles were linked in some way, as there aren't any parallels between them in the episode, but it seems like a logical connection to make given how the rest of the show works. Jill, the new neighbour, is instead played by Sarah Kennedy, now known as Sarah Ann Kennedy, who is a voice actor for kids TV shows, Peppa Pig and the like. At least I think that's her? There are apparently lots of Sarah Kennedys, and I think their credits have become a bit jumbled up online. I doubt this woman from Daydream Believers was in an American made-for-TV movie in 1979, as is claimed on IMDb for instance. She, as far as I can tell, had never appeared in anything with Mitchell and Webb prior to this, and didn't appear in anything with them afterwards. And she's… okay, I guess? The comedy around her character really arises from her being a relative straight woman to raise weirdness, and so she's not really much of a funny character on her own. The actress is fine, perfectly serviceable, she does her job. I don't really have much more to say about her, and as I mentioned, she has no sci-fi version of her character, leading to her only getting two real scenes of any significance, both of which admittedly are some of the funnier ones in the show though. And the whiskey. And the whiskey, yes. Oh, right. Though on that point, I find it weird that this is the case with her. Ray cares enough about the random anti-capitalist people that he barely interacts with in the episode to include them in his story, yet doesn't include any reference to the woman he's presumably romantically interested in who has just moved in next door to him. I don't know, I just find that a bit of an odd choice to make from a writing perspective. If you're making a show that's premise revolves around contrasting the events of reality with the way that Ray wants to think about them, surely a love interest would be one of the most fitting storylines to showcase this idea. It makes you wonder how involved Jill would have been in the show if it had progressed further than this episode. Maybe she was only supposed to be a quick one-off character, and that her involvement with Ray in this episode was just meant to be a funny little interaction, and it wasn't actually setting up anything for the future. Which, yeah, would have been a bit of a strange decision for a pilot episode like this, especially as at the end of the episode, Ray and Colin comment that they won't be seeing the anti-capitalist group again. So, you won't be seeing your final solution buddies anymore. I couldn't go back really. Overall, Jill is fairly unremarkable, which I suppose is, if nothing else, better than being noticeably bad at least. Um, fuck? A group of people who are more noteworthy and interesting to talk about though are the members of Final Solution, and yes, that name is obviously part of the joke. They are the main focal point in this episode outside of Mitchell and Webb, and so they have both their real selves and their Ray sci-fi story characters. Michael Fenton Stevens plays Ian and Wisdom, Joanna Scanlon plays Joy and Pity, and Jamie Deeks plays Wayne and Sucker, all three of whom have had careers in film and television to varying degrees of notability throughout the years, and some may be familiar with them. Though I will give a special special mention here to Jamie Deeks, who is almost certainly the least well known of the trio, as he is one of the few actors to have appeared in both The Office and Peep Show, two of my favourite TV comedies as you can probably gather from looking at my channel. He's one of the more noticeable background characters in The Office, playing a character named after himself, Jamie. Sorry, what are you saying? I just, just, I want to, you know. And also apparently plays the taxi driver that picks up Zara that one time in Series 7 of Peep Show. Thank you IMDB, I honestly had no idea that was him. You demand. I demand. No, you demand. <laughs> So yes, they are all members of, as Ian states, Final Solution, the billericky cell of the anti-capitalist movement. They're decently funny, and they have some fun lines, more so in the real world rather than in the sci-fi story though. That side of their characters is definitely the weaker one in my opinion. Like their characters live on a planet or whatever named Ooh. All who come in peace are welcome here in Ooh. I guess that's a joke? Is that a reference to something that I just don't get? Is that supposed to be funny? It's repeated multiple times, so I guess so. And only on planet 
<sighs> These characters lean fairly heavily on the random equals funny style of comedy, which I personally am not a big fan of. I don't think I touched on it earlier, but basically the way their sci-fi selves are worked into the story is that Amstrad is ill, and the only cure is in the possession of the people from Ur, who also have a group of giant metal wasps. Amstrad plans to get cured by them and then steal said army of giant metal wasps. He gets rejected by the Uans, but then says fuck it, I'm gonna steal their wasps anyway, and so his crew do so, blowing up their society in the process. <laughs> And if it's not clear, the show has both some obvious and some not so obvious references to socio-political groups and themes throughout the whole duration. I thought we might call it our Night of the Long Knives. Sounds quite good, doesn't it? Nazi jokes are plenty. Swastikas, Anne Frank, Hitler being misunderstood. Then there's lots of stuff about hippie rubbish and anti-capitalists being hypocrites and following social courses to have a hobby and stuff like that. Even if everything was perfect, people like you would still be having a fantastic time moaning. War, conflicts, the futuristic society taking advantage of the peaceful isolated one and so on. Though this is one of the aspects of the show that I don't think works overly well. All of the political commentary in the episode feels really scatterbrained and like it's just trying to do way too much. Like they wanted to write about things like Nazis and make Hitler jokes and have tirades about the pros and cons of capitalism, but it's so directionless that lots of the things Mitchell and Webb may have been trying to say feel like they just get lost in the dialogue. Nobody gets your obscure little references. The show feels so overloaded with ideas and themes and jokes and characters that it undermines any sort of message they may have wanted to convey, and it leads to it feeling like a rough draft of a script rather than one that was ready to go into production. You've got the whole premise of the real world and the fourth wall breaking meta narrative in the sci fi story coexisting, which both simultaneously are telling their own stories while also having this political subtext. Then this is all going on in a script that's constantly firing off jokes and non sequiturs, but then it's also the pilot episode, so we're being introduced to so many different characters characters at once, while also presumably setting up plot threads for future episodes, and then on top of that, the relentless pacing leaves absolutely no time to think about any of this on the fly. It's just way too much. You're quite right, sir. Beep. You could feasibly just completely cut out the anti-capitalist plot entirely, and all the political commentary along with it strength through joy and have the episode revolve around the introduction of Ray, Colin and their neighbour Jill while slowly working in the sci-fi element. This would have allowed for a much more cohesive story as there's easily enough content here for two separate episodes but in this state it's just BAM right into so much at once. I think David and Robert basically just overworked themselves and they bit off more than they could chew. Funnily enough a first episode that introduces Mitchell and Webb's characters and their neighbour while slowly letting us know how the format of the show works is basically exactly how the first episode of Peep show Warring Factions plays out. Okay. I don't think all of this aspect of the episode is a mess though, don't get me wrong. There are some decent lines and jokes that relate to this whole Nazi capitalism thing going on. For example, there's a funny bit about the Khmer Rouge supposedly being the owners of Café Rouge, the coffee chain, because they sound vaguely similar. It's their legitimate arm. And the various examples of the group's hypocrisy are fun, but I think these jokes work a lot better when they aren't interwoven into basically every single aspect of the show, as I found it quite overwhelming. Though the show does acknowledge that it's inserting these kind of jokes into every moment it can, which is kind of fun in a meta, self-aware kind of way. You always have to bring up politics, no matter how inappropriate the situation. So this whole thing was obviously intentional, but for me at least, it does feel like this would end up feeling a bit tiresome after a while. A whole series worth of episodes of this show continually patting itself on the back for unceremoniously name-dropping random historical names and events into regular conversations would be completely obnoxious. But as we've only got one episode, it's okay for now. Well, it's a bit different, isn't it? Shows you're not afraid of a bit of fun. Something that I will say about Daydream Believers is that it feels very comedy scripty, for better or for worse. It's not trying to be a show about realistic characters in a real world, rather every line of dialogue, every interaction between characters has been fine-tuned specifically to fit in as much humour as possible. They're not hippies, Ray, they're social warriors. It's all the same green bollocks. And they do wash, they do not have green bollocks. That's not a bad thing per se, it's just a style, and I can imagine a lot of people would really enjoy this constant joking, but I personally prefer comedies that take a different approach to this. Take something like The Office, the original one, obviously. Fantastically observed comedy that is interwoven into a mundane setting with mostly mundane characters. Even if you're not hearing a joke or seeing someone do something wacky, the show is still enthralling, and because of this, it manages to make even small, seemingly insignificant moments hilarious and memorable. Yeah. <laughs> Just try on, try on properly. In case you have to take it back. Yeah. <laughs> Just try on without that stuff under 
how dull, natural, and non-comedy script-like certain elements of the show are only end up making the whole package even funnier. Whereas Daydream Believers feels like it's always trying to be funny. No conversation feels like a real conversation, they're all just vessels for jokes. I could understand that if it were just like this in the sci-fi side of the episode, as that's intentionally hammy and over the top, but I think the constant joking and riffing makes it a lot harder to see any of the real world characters as real people, though maybe they weren't even going for that in the first place, who knows at this point. I think it being written this way kind of makes sense given Mitchell and Webb's background. The two TV shows they had written prior to this were both sketch comedies, where this kind of writing is obviously necessary. In a minute long comedy skit, nobody gives a shit about the background to any of the characters, we just want them to get to the jokes. But I'm not sure this approach works as well for a sitcom, especially not one that is trying to execute such an unconventional premise. You know, the two just don't tessellate. No. Go. Yeah, they don't go. The show is also quite crass and vulgar. Not that I'm against that style of comedy or anything, far from it. I enjoy that approach quite a lot, but I found it quite jarring here. I mentioned Ray's back crash earlier on. It's something that he has Colin apply some cream to. Yet something that's mentioned in this episode is that at one point when Colin wasn't around to put the cream on, Ray hired a prostitute to do it instead, yet she didn't believe that he didn't want to have sex with her, so they made a compromise where he pissed in her face. <laughs> In the end, we compromised. She put the cream on, I pissed on her face. We left it at that. Like, what? It's a funny line, if only because of how undavid Mitchell like it is, but it is just strange. One minute the show wants to try and make socio political commentary and parody sci fi, the next it's pissing in prostitutes' faces or acting like saying fuck is the funniest thing ever. Although, admittedly, I do like those fuck moments in this episode. They're some of the better instances of Ray acting like an oddball. And I wouldn't have had to go to the prostitute. Oh, fuck. Sorry. Actually, you don't mind fuck. I forgot. I do like a lot of the comedy in the pilot. I think Mitchell and Webb's various characters are by far the best, but others do have some good moments too. However, one character that I haven't mentioned yet, who appears frequently throughout the episode as part of a running joke, is this guy. Credited as Delivery Man, referred to as Gary in the episode, and played by Gus Brown, someone who has worked with Mitchell and or Webb on a number of different projects over the years. He's the guy that delivers Ray's new BMW at the start of the episode, and then he also appears as the exact same character character in the sci-fi story too, where he delivers the Beamer to Baron Amstrad. He then appears in silence throughout the rest of the episode in both halves of the story, just sat around essentially twiddling his thumbs because, I assume, he has no way of getting home after delivering the Beamers. You can see him wearing his blue overalls in a whole variety of scenes, everywhere from in the background across the road when Joe initially knocks on Ray's door, to right in the midst of the rest of the characters during the meeting between Amstrad and the Uans. I guess this character's sole purpose is to be a bit of fourth wall breaking humour, but it also kind of works in universe. It has been established that Ray is a pretty lazy writer, and so in lieu of any better way to write it, he just wrote that the exact same man that delivered his new car also delivered the Beamer in his story, even though it doesn't really make sense. It's kind of stupid, sure, well maybe not kinda, maybe very stupid, but I just view this as a little fun thing in the background, it's fine. So what happened to the giant metal wasps? Something that I'd say is a lot more than just fine in Daydream Believers though, is the general production quality. The sets, props and costumes are all really well done for what they are. Plus the CG sequence at the end with the giant robot wasp is actually incredibly good for this time period. For a seemingly lowish budget Channel 4 comedy pilot from 2001, this shit is really fucking impressive. In my opinion, the giant robot space wasps in Daydream Believers look better than a lot of the CG stuff in that Mitchell and Webb look which aired 7 years after this, and by which point the process was a lot cheaper, faster and easier to do, which is pretty amazing. So good job Toy Box who may be any one of the numerous VFX studios that share that name. As like with one of the actresses earlier, the credits listed online for those involved in this pilot are not entirely accurate, if they're even listed at all. Normally in pilots and demos, I'm not too bothered by things like locations, sets, props, costumes and the like, because oftentimes these shows are made on very low budgets, and I'd rather the money go towards more important aspects of the production. However, this pilot actually performs surprisingly well in this area. The real life interior to Ray's house is probably the worst in the episode, which is a shame because it gets featured a lot. You'd have thought that they could have done something a little more interesting here. I'd expect two weird bachelors living together with plenty of money to spend to have a living room that looks a little more interesting than my grand's front room. You're what? 
There is a pretty decent gag where the mock Tudor exterior on Jill's house looks like a swastika, which looks pretty well done, and the sequence at the end with the group protesting is shot on an actual street. No fake storefronts here, but it's really the sci-fi stuff that I think stands out the most. Look at some of these sets, they look pretty good for what they are. Yes, if you look closer, you can see the ship looks to be a redecorated interior of a nightclub or something, but I think it's kind of charming. Low budget enough to be quirky and interesting, but not lazy to the point that it looks like no effort went into it. I like it. Plus, I mentioned it earlier, but the giant screen thing that Olivia Coleman's character uses throughout the episode actually does look really good. The place used for the meeting between Amstrad and the Ewans has this cool purple square background, a mirrored bit on the wall, which if you squint your eyes a bit, does kind of look pretty space age, but with the campy nature of this side of the episode, I think the sets do completely fit in with the tone of the show. They're fun and don't take themselves too seriously. The Ewans location, whatever it's supposed to be, also looks really good too, and not in a low budget good kind of way, but it legitimately is pretty great for a production of this size. I especially like the wide shot here, it gives you a nice view of the whole room. Their costumes are all the same and are all pretty basic, monk-esque robes as their characters are peaceful people, it makes sense. They have staves too, and star-shaped tattoos on their foreheads, which totally weren't drawn on with marker pen. But the sci-fi costumes of Amstrad and his crew, I think they're great. Info's android getup especially. If you break down each element, it's pretty basic. Knight's armor spray-painted silver, a wrestling belt maybe, spray-painted silver, a little helmet spray painted silver, a face spray painted silver, but you can tell someone actually put some effort into this getup. No, he doesn't really look like an android, but it's charming. The colourful reflections from the bodysuit thing he has on underneath are pretty nice too. Likewise, Baron Amstrad's outfit looks great. I have basically the same praises for it as I do for Info. Low budget, pretty basic, but someone clearly tried when making it, and I think it paid off, especially the hair, which is really good. I wonder if his, sorry history nerds, Spolder? Pauldron? thing was originally part of the same costume that Info's armor was from. I honestly wouldn't doubt it, and that's kind of fun. We were being very polite. Very, very polite. Something else that I like to say about Daydream Believers, which I guess I should have also acknowledged earlier may have been named after the song by the Monkees. I don't know what that song would have to do with anything in the pilot though, but whatever. I will say that the pacing of the episode feels a bit off. It feels very top heavy, which leads to the ending feeling very rushed in my opinion. The main ending sequence in which the giant space wasps blow up the planet and the anti-capitalist group do their protest only starts less than two minutes before the episode ends, which feels very strange given that these events have so much time spent on their setup. Another just general comment about the episode that I'll make that ties into my overarching feelings on the project is that I feel like this premise and gimmick could get really tiring after a while. The constant swapping between the real world and the sci-fi story leaves the show feeling like it's on the move non-stop. I like the gimmick as a one-off thing here, but I'm not sure how I'd find, let's say, an entire six episode long series of it. The frequent cuts to different universes leaves gaps in both sides of the story, which could get quite tedious too. You'll be with some characters in a scene, we cut back to the other universe and then go back to the original characters who are now somewhere different as time has progressed, but we don't get to see or hear any of that. I think it would be harder to convey an engaging story with this approach. Also, I'm not sure if the novelty of the goofy sci-fi side of the episodes would wear off over time. It's funny seeing David and Rob in silly costumes pretending to be futuristic space travellers, but after you've seen that play out five times or so, you can't just rely on the novelty to carry the episodes anymore. I'd say I do like Daydream Believers overall. I enjoyed watching it and talking about it, and while I do have quite a few issues with it, as a one-off thing like this pilot obviously is, I think I would recommend it to everyone that likes the works of Mitchell and Webb, if only to see some more obscure content from their young years before they became a part of Peep Show and before they were anywhere near as well known as they became a few years after this. But obviously this pilot didn't lead to a full series, it can't have been a hit over at Channel 4's comedy department, and given the lack of fan discussion about it online, it doesn't seem to have made much of an impression with the viewers either. So Daydream Believers faded into obscurity, and everyone involved moved on to bigger and better things, the concept never to be heard from ever again. What do we have here? Mitchell and Webb in Daydream Believers, original Radio 2 comedy from BBC Audio. David Mitchell and Robert Webb star in the BBC radio show Daydream Believers. David Mitchell and Robert Webb, parallel stories of two flatmates Ray and Colin. Yep, it's Daydream Believers, all right. Radio 2 comedy? Sure. Original? Maybe not. My copy of this radio version of Daydream Believers was actually sealed when I bought it, which would have been a nice little thing to keep in my collection, but I thought I'd take one for the team and open it to see if the front insert had anything interesting in it, which it doesn't really. But when I did, the jewel case actually had a bunch of broken pieces of plastic loose inside it. I guess it hasn't fared so well over the years. 
the years, more specifically being 14 years, as this radio version of Daydream Believers was first broadcast on the 5th of May 2007, and the physical copy was apparently available from around the 3rd of September 2007. So for some Mitchell and Webb context, this is from the time period around Peep Show's fourth series, between that Mitchell and Webb looks first and second series, and around the release of the feature-length comedy Magicians. So David and Rob were pretty big names by this point, yet decided to return to something that never really got off the ground, and that even their core audience had probably never heard of. This radio version of the show, which one can only assume was also supposed to be a pilot episode that was looking for an audience, just like the TV version was, is actually quite a bit different to the original iteration of the show, and in ways that I think are pretty interesting to look at. But first, some obvious observations to note. Radio ain't got no visuals. This means that even though this version still retains the parallel story gimmick, we don't actually get to see our characters' appearances change. No crazy costumes, no quirky sets, no cool props, you'll just have to picture those things in your head. Imagine is the word. I'm, I'm not talking about imagining anymore, Colin. We can all have a good imagine. That's obvious. I'm sure everyone knows how radio works. But in the context of this specific show, I think that's quite a shame. One of the things that I really liked about the original was seeing our actors physically playing two different sets of characters. It added to the idea that Ray's writing was using inspiration from his real life. He pictures his characters exactly like the people he's basing them off. And that really helped to cement the concept of the show. It was a visual indication of what was going on and helps you understand the premise a little better, as the show really doesn't go out of its way to explain itself to the audience. No, well, a bit. So I guess that poses the question, why take the radio approach? Well, both David and Rob have a long history of working on radio programs, so they may have just liked the idea of having their own radio sitcom, but also obviously a radio comedy is a lot cheaper to produce than a television one. Maybe this was the only way they could get anyone to agree to fund their second attempt at a Daydream Believers pilot. I'm not sure. Given that the duo had been part of multiple award-winning projects by this point, and had lots of attention coming that way, I'm sure they held a strong enough position in the industry to get another TV comedy pilot off the ground if they really wanted to. Maybe they just didn't want to oversaturate themselves on one medium, or perhaps Perhaps this was just a passion project they wanted to revisit for a bit of fun, and they didn't really care about how the show was delivered. Maybe they just liked the characters of Ray, Colin, Baron Amstrad and Info that much. I have no answers to any of these questions, but they're food for thought at least. So a quick plot synopsis of this radio version of Daydream Believers is as follows. Well, it's the beginning of a new story. I've got Baron Amstrad and his robot Info in a room, and I don't know what they should do. Ray is trying to write a sci-fi blockbuster featuring his character, Baron Amstrad, but he keeps getting pestered by people trying to tell him about issues that animals are facing in the world. I've got a sci-fi blockbuster to write. I can't sit around caring about nature. Colin wants to become a father and has begun attending antenatal classes to try and find someone to have a kid with, which doesn't seem to be going too well. To learn how to look after a baby, he gets a bag of sugar to take care of, which promptly gets ripped open, leaving sugar all over the floor of the pair's house, which attracts ants. Oh, bless him. He, he's got a bit ripped. In Ray's sci-fi story, Baron Amstrad, Info, and the other crew, including Linda, played by Olivia Coleman, are minding their own business, but then they find out that an aggressive alien species, known as the Labradons, who sound like they're half-dog, half-Dalek, and who turn their victims into Labradons too, are rapidly approaching. <laughs> The Labradons can't think individually, but attack as a group. Amstrad thinks this makes them like insects, such as ants. Although Colin thinks Labradons may be more similar to dogs. I wonder why. Amstrad reveals that he is becoming broody and wishes he had a child, and in the real world, Ray and Colin have a discussion about how cross-breeding cats and dogs is definitely not a good idea. Cats and dogs don't fancy each other, Colin. Come off it, Ray. All that chasing. In order to make a peace deal between the Labradons and his people, Amstrad agrees to have a diplomatic child with the Labradon ambassador, a male dog. Though he is adamant in stating that this is definitely two aliens having intercourse and not a man having sex with a dog. It is not, not a, a man and a dog. Me and a dog. Not. <laughs> right? Good for you, sir. You keep telling yourself that. The episode then ends with Info meeting this new half-dog, half-whatever alien species Amstrad is, complete with big soulful eyes, hairy hands, and a habit of licking his own genitals. He's licking his- Oh, yeah. yeah. He gets that from his dad. Okay, maybe quite a bit different to the original was an understatement. We've got the same lead characters played by Mitchell and Webb, some of the same supporting cast with Olivia Coleman returning, and the same general premise of the show, with it revolving around a real-life story and a sci-fi story written by Ray that takes inspiration from his real-life conversations, but apart from that, things are very, very different. Out with Jill, the anti-capitalists and their Uwen counterparts, space wasps, the Nazi and political commentary, beamers, space plagues, back rashes and prostitute references, 
and in with the Labradons, talk of insects and a desire to have a child. Story-wise, it bears very little, if any, resemblance to the original Daydream Believers plot. It's essentially a completely new beginning for the show. Something that's also left out of this radio version is the plentiful swearing and almost gratuitous vulgarity that was present in the TV pilot. I'll leave you two to get on with it. I'll just disappear. There is not a single swear word in this audio version's 27 minute runtime, and despite it having a little joke about Amstrad having sex with a member of an alien species that may or may not be dog-like, that's all it is really, a little joke. The stronger and more adult themes are nowhere near as present as in the original. Oh sir, that's so gross! I'd almost certainly wager this being because of this being a pilot that'd be played on radio during the daytime, rather than on a late night TV block like the original would have been. A cursory glance at the broadcast history of this episode shows that in 2008 it even had an airing at half past one in the afternoon on BBC Radio 2. Not exactly a time slot you'd want filled with jokes about pissing in prostitutes' faces, but a little bit of light-hearted innuendo and toned-down implied obscenity would probably go over just fine. But you're silver all over and covered in blinking lights. Don't you be rude about my lights! So as I said, the cast is mostly changed, with only David Mitchell, Robert Webb and Olivia Colman reprising their roles. But we do have three new actors here. Mark Evans, a long-time collaborator of Mitchell and Webb's, provides the opening and closing voiceovers, and he also plays a character that we hear get turned into a Labradon. Daydream Believers, starring David Mitchell and Robert Webb. The well-known Simon Greenall plays Dr. Smith, this kind of wacky meta character that Ray just inserts into his story because he felt like there should be a doctor. Info! Hey! How long have I? It's me, quack! And actor Mark Benton plays Geddes, another crewmate on the spaceship, one who I don't think I ever mentioned, but actually was in the original TV pilot, played by a guy named Stephen Powell, but he didn't really do or say anything noteworthy in that version, so I didn't go out of my way to bring him up. Yes, we're back. While Ray and Colin are the same characters, with the same roles played by the same people, they act quite a lot differently to the original TV version, to the point where they don't really feel like they're the same characters. Ray isn't as much of a strange person, he seems a lot more confident, and he doesn't have the weird guy voice. Thanks, said Baron Amstrad. Return safe. Colin feels a lot less serious of a person, and he seems to have a much more outgoing personality. Hi Ray, I'm back. Though their sci-fi characters, Baron Amstrad and Info, don't have these same changes, they remain relatively the same. This version is not only different in its plot, but also just in general. The mood and tone, the approach to comedy is just very unlike the original, and so it's hard to simply just compare them. The original had this kooky atmosphere, it had weird energy, the odd humour, the socio-political undertones. It felt strange in a way that those involved probably intended it to, but also in ways they probably didn't. This radio version loses that entire aspect, and despite the unorthodox premise that Daydream Believers uses, it feels like much more of a conventional take at making a radio comedy. The show is accompanied with a laugh track, as it was clearly recorded in front of a live studio audience, which I guess technically makes it not a laugh track, but whatever. I know some pedant will point that out, so I thought I'd just acknowledge it. There's times where you can hear someone repeat their lines, or where they'll wait for the laughter to die down before saying their next line. Uh, sir, perhaps I can help. There's only really ever been one fleet. When I listen to this thing, it's hard to picture it as an actual radio sitcom. It just sounds like an extended length segment from that Mitchell and Webb sound or something, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I do enjoy that show, but it feels like less of an attempt at a comedy pilot and more Mitchell and Webb reading a funny script they wrote. Amstrad turns moodily towards a vacuum of space. The stars like flecks of tippets that have been flicked onto some black curtains, but on purpose. Throughout my life, I've always listened to things while I fall asleep, whether that be radio, podcasts, music, and so on. And for whatever reason, when I was younger, probably too young to fully understand what I was hearing, I actually used to listen to loads of BBC radio sitcoms. I don't really remember too much about them now, and I haven't listened to them in years. But some things I listened to were like old Harry's game, stuff with a character named John Shuttleworth. I remember there was a radio program with an up-and-coming David Tennant named Double Income No Kids Yet. One-liner comedian Milton Jones did a lot of radio stuff too. I realise this probably means nothing to anyone. But I guess the point that I wanted to make is that this isn't some unfamiliarity with a medium that is making me see the radio version of Daydream Believers as anything other than Mitchell and Webb sat in front of an audience reading a script. I've listened to a lot of material that doesn't sound like this, so it's definitely something that can be achieved. I think I'd prefer if it didn't have the audience laughter. I don't need to be told when things are supposed to be fun and I think it's one of the main proponents in me not buying into this show. Oh. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mitchell and Webb have used audience laughter in ways that do improve their works at certain times, like that rocket scientist bit from that Mitchell and Webb look is a great example of laughter being used for comedic effects. Oh Jeff, the 
to keep you late at the Space Centre. As always. <laughs> Have you met Lionel? But for the most part, I really don't like it. It's one of the reasons that I find myself re-watching Bruiser and the Mitch and the Webb situation much more than their other sketch stuff, as there's no audience laughter there. <laughs> Although the ridiculousness of the plot combined with the fact that it sounds like David and Rob are doing a table read may have been intentional. Both iterations of the show are very meta and self-referential, and not being able to take the show seriously may have been part of the joke, though that's kind of a boring way to look at it. Colin, I'll be the first to admit that. The balance between each side of the story feels a lot more disjointed in this radio version. Nothing at all really happens in the real life side of the episode. It's just Ray and Colin talking to each other. There's no other characters besides the lead pair, and that's very different to the original episode, which had both Jill and the final solution group. All the real action, if you can call it that, happens in the sci-fi story, which is the side of the episode that I definitely do prefer. I've been precisely engineered to be as like a human as possible. Beep. Were. But it feels like there is very much an imbalance between the two sides of the story. The real life side of the episode is quite unremarkable, not in terms of the humour, as I think there's some great moments in it, and I definitely did enjoy listening to it, but in terms of the story perspective, not much really happens in it, and nearly every scene is just Ray and Colin sat down talking to each other in their home. The scale of that side of the episode is definitely a lot smaller here. There's comparatively little new stimuli to inspire Ray's writing in the radio version in comparison to the TV version. There he got a new neighbour, a new car and his friend joined an anti-capitalist group, introducing him to a kooky new group of people. Here someone emails him about animal welfare and his friend wants to become a father. I don't think it's a very strong basis for an episode. Also, I really wish it was Ray that wanted to become a father and not Colin. In the original, Amstrad is basically Ray's self-insert character. He is what Ray wants wants to see himself as. Here, Ray writes Amstrad's side of the story so that it revolves around something that is happening to Colin in real life, not him. I guess there's nothing inherently wrong with that really, but I think having Amstrad being Ray's poorly written main character that is essentially just him, really went hand in hand with the pervasive idea that Ray was a pretty bad writer and he was writing low quality material. Well, the best one to start with would be Amstrad and the massive fight between spaceships, which is one of my earlier novels. The parallel between ideas like Ray having a bank rash and his sci-fi character having the space plague, and him getting a new beamer and his sci-fi character getting a new beamer really felt like more in line with the premise of the show than having his sci-fi character story be based on events that have no parallel to him personally in the real world. I think that was a mistake in terms of the narrative of this iteration of Daydream Believers. It feels like it somewhat contradicts the overall idea at play here. Hypocrisy Alert. This story revolving around the Labradons is okay. It's a pretty funny basis for jokes, but in terms of the actual plot, it's not overly interesting or particularly clever. Even though I was fairly critical of the way that the TV version went about its story, specifically in regards to the anti-capitalists, their Uwen counterparts, and the attempts at social commentary, I'd say that I do prefer that story over this one with the Labradons. This radio version actually has a longer runtime than the original, and yet it feels like it has much less to offer in terms of a complete or engaging plot. You could easily argue that the story doesn't really matter here, and that it only exists to provide a framework around which David and Rob can joke about sci-fi or whatever they want to talk about, but I still think that it's important. They chose to return to Daydream Believers for a reason, whatever that reason was, and if they didn't care about the story, they could have easily used some of the themes and ideas in something like That Mitchell and Webb Sound instead, where nobody is expecting anything other than jokes. What's his problem? I think he's a bit stressed about the invasion. Well, yeah, that's not gonna help. So, while story-wise, I don't think this radio pilot is as good as the TV one, it still has some comedic moments that I thought were really great. David and Rob really wrote some good material here, and you can tell they had a lot of fun performing their script too. That is one of the benefits of recording in front of a live audience, I suppose. It means they can play around a bit more, and I'm gonna be taking things entirely seriously, which fits with Daydream Believers as a whole. I'd love to have footage of this performance, even though it'd obviously just be the actors sat down reading pages of a script. I think it had really improved the overall experience for me, but that's unfortunately something that we're never going to get. One of my favourite moments in this radio version comes from Info's beeping, something that was carried over from the original episode. Beep, sir, the Labrador and Why did the console beep twice? Didn't, the second one was me. Oh. And I also like the bit where Geddes, Mark Benton's character, makes reference to the fact that he's just been standing around in silence after his lines were finished, but he was never heard leaving the room. Can I go? <laughs> what? Well, I've just been standing here, can I go? This is a joke that would only really work with a solely audio-based show, and so I'm glad that Mitchell and Webb did take advantage of this medium with moments like this. Never meddle with nature, Colin. Never meddle with nature. Never meddle with nature. Yeah. 
I don't think there's as much to talk about with his second attempt at Daydream Believers. It just feels like much more of a conventional comedy than the original did, and that's kind of a shame in my opinion, given that the first attempt felt very unique. I did get enjoyment out of both versions, but I'd say the original is more in line with both the kind of comedy that I prefer, and it also suits the premise better in my opinion. I don't love the original, it does have a lot of issues, the story is bloated and quite confusing, it often feels like it's trying way too hard to be funny, the political stuff is kind of clumsy, the structure and pacing need work, and some of the comedy does feel a bit flat, but it still manages to be charming and fun. It's clearly something that those involved really tried their best to make work, and it has a lot of elements that do work well and make it an enjoyable watch. You can see that Mitchell and Webb clearly had something going on here, it just needed a lot of refining, something they probably just didn't have the time to do. The radio version is okay, as I said earlier it feels like a Mitchell and Webb sound skip, that's not an insult, but it just means that it's not quite the experience that the TV version is. It doesn't have the same atmosphere as its predecessor, and I don't think the gimmick works as well with the visual element gone, however I would still recommend both versions to, well, anyone really. The total runtime of both combined doesn't even reach an hour, and so you can fully experience the whole thing without much of a commitment. And I mean, if you've gotten this far into this video, I'm pretty sure you're the kind of person that would be interested in watching and listening to obscure bits of comedy like this, and you don't need me to say whether you'd enjoy Daydream Believers or not. You've probably made your mind up already, making what I'm saying now rather pointless. So that leaves us here. The book seemingly closed for Daydream Believers. A TV pilot in 2001, a radio pilot in 2007, and now it's 20 2021, 14 years since the most recent outing and the show still has not had a full series. Will it ever get one? Will we ever see the return of Ray, Colin, Baron Amstrad and Info? I highly doubt it. Times have changed and the core cast have moved on. Daydream Believers is just a footnote in their careers by this point. Some may want to believe that Daydream Believers could reappear again in the future, but I think that's little more than a daydream. <laughs>